after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you and cause you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, and I will bring you back from your captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you. And I will bring you to the place from which I cause you to be carried away captive. God has plans for me. Let me tell you, there are some things that God is going to do in your life that's going to change in your life to come. And I prophesy and speak today over everybody. The best is yet to come in your life. Can I hear an amen from somebody that's excited on Labor Day? When I talk about prayer, I think about the missionary that was running from the lion. The lion was chasing him through the jungles. He finally dropped with exhaustion. He said, God, I hope that's a Christian lion. Now, I do not know why any missionary, unless you are being chased by a lion, I, I have no idea why anybody would say or pray, I hope that's a Christian lion. But in this case, this missionary fell on his knees with exhaustion and said, God, I hope that's a Christian lion. He did not feel teeth. He did not feel claws. He did not feel the lion attacked me. He peeks out of the corner of his eye and sure enough, the lion is praying. And the lion is praying, Lord, bless this food for the nourishment of my body. That's a funny story to tell you that prayer does work. I don't know if it works for the lion and for the missionary, but how many knows prayer works? Some 38, 39 years ago on 1300 North Broad Street in a prayer room and there was orange shag carpet and when I'd come to the church and Melody and I had come to take the church, it was sometime in the middle of the night. And I remember, I can't remember if it was an angel or it, it, and it might have been Jesus. I, I, I did not look at the figure only to know and sense that something had come uh, near me. And into my, uh, into my experience as I was weeping and crying and I had been there for several hours praying, uh, the voice or ever the communication of this being, which I knew was the presence of the Holy Spirit, uh, gave, me, uh, gave me an instruction. I then gave it to the congregation saying that on Labor Day, we will come together and pray at six o'clock in the morning. I was amazed that morning when, I don't know, maybe four or 500, I can't give you the, uh, the attendance of the exact number, but anyway, it looked like that the auditorium was full and we were all amazed and we were shocked that that many people came for 60 minutes of prayer on Labor Day. And then the instruction of this came to me and said, if you will do this, I will heal, I will do great things. And at that time, in the rust belt of this region of Chicagoland area, we were actually in a recession in the early 80s. And I, I watched God as God began to unfold in the steel mills and the labor and, and, and the suffering and, and, and the joblessness that uh, was upon humanity at that time here in this region and also in Illinois and Chicago. I saw God turn that around immediately. We begin to do job fairs and begin to give jobs to people by hundreds and hundreds and hundreds along with others that participated. And I saw God uh, heal the land. It was unbelievable. And so we continued it. I, I never believed that the instruction that night that God had plans that we would be doing it 39 years later in the morning. 
Evidently, God, God had plans for Family Christian Center. And, 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 and the ministry here of people who, who have been a part of this ministry, all of you and the whole congregation and the community of Family Christian Center, watching every Labor Day, thousands of people coming. And when the people c come and the people come to pray at six o'clock in the morning, we don't put any chairs out in the front so people start filling up the altar areas and the aisles. And, and, and there has been incredible days in which uh, uh, more people, more people than what we seek are standing and coming and, and it's been a testimony. You should hear me when I'm in discussion with the pastors nationwide and whether it be a conference or whether it be a table talk and the question comes up, what is your biggest Sunday? Is it Easter? Is it Christmas Eve? Or is it, what is it in your church? And pastors would go around, they come to me and I say, the biggest crowds we ever had, uh, bigger than Bishop Jake, bigger than our Jesus of Nazareth, bigger than anything that we do, even Joyce Myers, anyone that has been special, has been our six o'clock prayer meeting on Labor Day. And they would look, yes, clap, everybody clap. I mean, that's a, that's a great testimony. And, 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 and pastors and, and lay leaders and people would say to me, how can that happen? That's impossible. We call prayer meetings and we can't get that many to come to prayer meeting. We have thousands come to our churches, but we, we cannot get a prayer meeting to be attended like it should be by uh, the attendants that are on Sunday. And I begin to tell them, Year after year, we have seen the move of God. We have seen the most magnificent things happen. I wonder when God was making plans for Family Christian Center, he knew that 39 years later that there would be people that would be called by his name and that God could depend upon and that God would be able to heal the land through that prayer meeting. Now, now China is joining us in the uh, same time zone. Now is India joining us in the, the same time zone. Dr. Paul will be praying. He is building right now a 35,000 seated uh, auditorium and a stadium. And he, they, have, they, have, they have raised the money in India. Not one dollar has come from America. And, and, and he is probably the most powerful person in prayer his knees are so calloused. He, he spends six to seven hours a day in prayer and, and it will be the largest congregation there in India and we'll have the privilege to go and dedicate the brand new church. But in the morning, he guarantees us over 55,000 at 6 p.m. their time, 6 a.m. our time, they will be praying with us. And then Michael represents the, the countries that he told you today. And Africa is going to join us. I had no idea that 30 some years ago that God would be raising us up. And we we're about to change the world in 60 minutes. Everybody shout prayer. I want to go back to the scripture reading that they had today in Jeremiah. In our reading today, Jeremiah talks about uh, uh, something about all of you. He talks about, thus saith the Lord. And, he, and th this is a suppressed time in the scriptures of 70 years. And they were in Babylon, God's people. And the next verse says that God said, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord. And I want to tell everybody, whatever captivity, whatever you're going through, whatever you're believing for, whatever your dreams, that you might say within yourself, Oh God, I, I, I'm believing for certain things for my children, my grandchildren, or for my own life. All of you that are here to say, oh God, I need power to get wealth. I need favor. I need healing. I need help. I need, I need, I need scholarships. I need, I need a blessing. God has, a, leave that up for me just for a second, please. God has says, look, I, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. And here's what God's thinking about every one of you, to give you peace and not evil. I want to say it again. God's getting ready. He says, I think peace towards you. When you talk about peace, you talk about prosperity. I think prosperity towards you. 
I want you to be the best. I want you to have the best. I want you to be raised up so people will look at you and say, how come you have this and how come you go here and how come you are blessed with that? God says, the thoughts of peace and not evil. And he says, to give you a future of hope. I want you to think about that. Everybody say, God thinks good things about me. And God says, now, what I'm going to do, I got, your I, got your, I got your next husband. I'm not talking about you that are already married. I'm talking about those that are not married. I'm talking about he's got your husband in, uh, the, in your future. He's got your wife. He's got children. You don't even see it, but there's some people here today. You, you haven't got a family yet, but God is getting ready. He sees your future. You're going to have the best children. You're going to have the best family. You're going you're to have the best husband. You're going to have the best wife. I'm looking at somebody today, you may be single and he may have left you and the relationship went rough, but God says, I'm going to turn that around and I'm going to bless you and you're going to have a great house and you're going to have great scholarship and your children are going to be raised and I think great things towards you. God is looking at every one of you today. Don't you dare let the devils tell you God doesn't love me because I made a mistake. We all make mistakes, but God is not looking at your mistakes. He's looking at the miracle that he's about ready to pour upon your life. These are the words of God. He says, I know you've been in captivity. Some of you have been in debt. Some of you have been in health situations. Some of you have been in relationship issues. Some of you have had trouble with your children. Some of you are struggling with your parents. Some of you are saying, oh, I just pray and hope that, that I get to the next level in my life. I want you to know the God that made you is thinking such good things and he's got incredible plans for your life and it's gonna be more than you can even think. In fact, the scripture verse says, he is able to do abundantly above all we think or even ask. Now look at the next scripture verse because if you know that God thinks all of those things about you, he says, now I want you to do something. When you call upon me, he says, when you pray, he says, when you call upon me and you go and you pray to me, I will listen to you. Now think about this, that God has already got your future. God is already wanting to bless you. God is already wanting to bring priests to you. And he knows that most of us have made mistakes and we have done things that we should not have done. And sometimes we use our faith too much on our past. Now let me talk about that for a minute. We use our faith too much on our past. Always saying to God, we shouldn't have made that mistake. We shouldn't have done that, etc. Stop it today. God has already forgiven you. Get ready for a future and a tomorrow. His plans are about to explode in your life. But you got to do something. He says, I want you to pray. I want you to go and pray to me and I will listen to you. What will happen? Oh God, if I do that, the next verse says in Jeremiah, if you seek me and you find me, when you search me with all of your heart and I'm going to tell you, anybody that drives here at six o'clock in the morning, I already know you're doing it with all your heart because you could sleep in and yes, you could sleep into 8, 30, 9, 30, 10, 30, 12, 30. You're still going to be tired when you get up so it won't matter if it's 5, 30, 5, 15 and you're saying, I'm going to do this. I'm going to get up. I'm going to do something that I don't do. I don't, I'm going to do something I normally don't do. I'm going to get up and what am I going to do? I'm going to seek him and I'm going to find him and I'm going to search him with all of my heart. And then the next verse says, he says in the next verse, I will be found by you. I'll meet you here, says the Lord, and I will bring back I will bring back from your captivity. In other words, anything that's been stolen from you, anything that's not worked out in your life, anything that has just went bad in your life, God says, look, I'm going to tell you what, I'm going to get back to you. I'm going to gather you. I'm going to bring you from places in which did not work out. And we're, where debt has driven you and people have driven you and things have driven you and I'm going to bring you to a place and I am going I am going to take you from where you've been captive and what is God saying to us I've got some plans for you because I'm going to raise you up and people people are going to look at you and they're going to say how did that happen to you and you're going to be able to say my God has blessed me anybody excited about that just shout and say amen or clap your hands 
When you look in the book of Saul, in the book of Chronicles, you will find these words that Solomon, in the second chapter of Second Chronicles and the first verse, he didn't say I would build a temple and I'm going to tell you that it took 158,000 in seven years. Listen to that. 158,000 workers built the temple in seven years. 158,000 Solomon hired to build the temple and it took seven years to build. But look what the scripture verse says. Solomon did not say, I am building a temple. I, I am building a church. Here is what Solomon says. He says in 2 Chronicles 2 and 1, and they just had it up. He says, he says, I am going to, I am going to build a place for your name. I am going to build a place for your name. He says, he says, if you'll look in the second verse, I want the second verse. The second verse says that Solomon told these three score and 10,000 men burden and four score thousand and goes into all of them. But, but, but the scriptures say in, in Chronicles 2, maybe we'll go back to one just for a second. And, and you will see, he says, and Solomon determined to build a house and, and, he, and, he, and, he, and, he, and he said, for the name of the Lord. He did not necessarily, I'm going to build murder and brick, but I'm going to build something for the name of the Lord. When he said that, when he said that, we can build, we can build, um, we can build with mortar and steeples and, and steel and drywall. We can build a church. We can build a building. But what is important is that we build something for the name of the Lord. When he said that, God showed up twice in Solomon's life. When Solomon, what was he saying? I want to build a place where the people can come and we can pray to the name of the Lord. That's exactly what he was saying. And the Bible said God showed up twice in Solomon's life. He showed up in the night. He showed up in a dream. He showed up in his sleep. And the first time that God showed up, after Solomon had made this commitment, God said to Solomon, what do you want? Let me just ask you, wonder if God comes tonight and in your dream, he asks you, what do you want? And then God says, you can have anything you want. That's exactly what happened to Solomon. Why did that happen to Solomon and what provoked God to come and say that to Solomon? Very few times in the Bible do we see God coming to someone and saying, what do you want? I'll give you anything. But in this case, because Solomon says, I'm going to create a place where we pray, where we come and pray in the name of the Lord. The Bible says that Solomon, Solomon responded to God and says, I want wisdom. He said, give me wisdom. As far as we know, everyone has agreed that there has not been someone as wise as Solomon before Solomon, and there has not been one as wise as Solomon after him, only our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But Solomon, Solomon, when he said, Lord, give me wisdom, God turned around and said, now that you've asked me for wisdom, I'm going to give you wealth. I'm going to give you money. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you I'm going to give you so much. Did you know that Solomon was so wealthy that his stables, you, you, you read about Solomon's stables. We're building an equestrian center, a behavior center for the veterans and autism and our children and people and veterinarians and a place where it's going to be for camps and it's going to be unbelievable. But can you imagine that Solomon had gold stalls for his expensive horses? That's how rich he was. That would be like all of you building a doghouse outside in your backyard out of solid gold. But you can't do that unless you're rich. Well, when God makes up in his mind to bless you, nobody can curse you. When God decides to give you a, a more money or gives you an idea or expands, expands, uh, expands your horizon and, and plans that he has for you, you will always notice that God will do that and especially what he did for Solomon, the Bible says that, that he says, because you want to create a place where my name will be there to pray. Then God shows up and tells Solomon, look Solomon, it will be me because I get real aggravated at the people that I created. 
by the sixth chapter of Genesis, one, two, three, four, five, six of Genesis, you will find that there was a generation from Adam that it was a whole lot of people that turned from God and they, and, and they got wrong in their sexual experiences. The Bible says there was given in marriage and just simply means they didn't get married at all. Then they married one another and when they did, it was man to man and, 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 and women to women in and, and Noah's day and then, and then they committed fornication and marriage vows were, uh, weren't uh, important and people just lived together and they would drink and they would eat and God said, I, I don't like this, I don't even know. In fact, the Bible says, God says, it repenteth me that I made man. And that was the first time that God turned on the world and because they did all of those things, he destroyed them except for one family. And then, and then humanity begins to build and goes again. And let me just tell you that when you get saved, when you get saved, there's something that God watches very closely about when you get saved. Now you may think that it's, he's watching you to see if you sin or not, but it's really not that. He's looking for something that you will not lose because when you are born again, you are given his name. You are given his name in baptism because the Bible says, the Bible talks about being born of the water and of the spirit to be born again. And when you go down in water, when you are baptized, that's when you are circumcised. That's when you are identified and that's when you are given his name. Then he takes your name and writes it in the Lamb's book of life. Let me tell you what your real name is. Let me tell you my real name. You want to hear it? It's Stephen Kent Muncy Jesus. And all of you have got Jesus. How many are born again here today? They shout a great big amen. You're born again. You're the people of his name. You will find one struggle in your Christian walk for you that are born again. You may struggle with tithing. You may struggle with church attendance. You may struggle with Bible reading. But there is one thing, one thing that God is concerned about the people of his name. And he told Solomon this. He said, Solomon, let me tell you, when I get aggravated, let me tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to make it real hard for the people. I, I, I'll bring inflation. I will bring locusts. I will make things happen where they won't have anything left over. Food prices will go, which is, which is inflation and, and recession times. And, I, and I'm the one that does that because the people have turned from me. They no longer appreciate me. And the fact is, is that I will send the locust, which is a type of inflation and struggle. And like we're struggling right now with gasoline going up and, and, and paying the bills and, and, and having enough left over and doing this, etc. God said, I will do, I'm, I'm going to send those problems because the people have forgotten about me. And then he says, let me tell you what else I'm going to do. You read this. If they'll, they'll show it to you in 2 Chronicles and the 13th verse in, in, in the 7th chapter. You'll see that God says, I send the pestilence. I send the COVID-19. I send the diseases because the people, the people, he says this, I will shut up the heavens. There'll be no rain. There will be famine. There will be fires. There will be difficulties. I will command the locusts. That's a type of, of problems. That's a type of locusts eating everything and all the harvest. This is God talking. Or he says, I will send pestilence. Pestilence means diseases. We have more diseases upon the earth than we have ever had. I will send sugar diabetes. I will send those things that, that, that begin to try to deteriorate the health. I will send them among my people. And he says, he says that's what I will do. But then he says in the next verse, he says, if, what is the first word in that scripture verse? If, if, if I am able, you need to turn that if around and say, I, I am the people which are called by my name. And Lord, it's not going to be an if in the morning. It's going to be a yes in the morning. And there will be no, no arguments in the if. And God says, if my people 
which are called by my name. If you're born again, you have his name. And the Bible says, if they will pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, and we do that through prayer. God, we're sorry. Lord, we do that through prayer. He says, I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin. And then he says, I will heal their land. I want to tell you what's going to happen in the morning. Gasoline's going to come down after we pray. Inflation's going to come down after we pray. And if it don't come to your neighbor, it's going to come to you. You're going to have more than enough. And God is going to supply all of your need. And God is going to put upon you until you are going to have overflow. For Luke 6.38 is going to happen to you. Give and it shall be given. Press down, shaken together, running over. God is about to do something. But if you pray, if you go to where his name is, he says, I will open up the windows of heaven. And let me tell you, we're all talking about we need more policemen. We need better leaders in, in, in Washington or state. We're all looking for the right party or for the right person to do the right thing. In the morning, we will take care of what Democrats and Republicans and independents, we will take care of what the dictator of Russia, Putin, can't do and, and what China can't do and Africa can't do. That in the morning, all the people that are called by his name is those born again people if we come where the name of the Lord is we will change the world can I get a big amen from somebody well I've never done that before pastor I've never gone up at 6 o'clock I, I can't even pray for an hour it's alright you come you know Jesus says watch and pray Sometimes you just got to watch somebody else pray. You watch pastor pray, you watch us pray. And in that time of prayer, you begin to seek God. It'll change your life. I'm telling you, it will change your life. I wish I could stand up here and tell you all the things that God has done. But I'm going to tell you, 60 minutes will change your life. Whether you get here in the 30 minutes or you get here for 40 minutes or you get here for the last 20 minutes. I want to tell you, it will change your life. And not only will it do it in the morning, but it will do it for the rest of your life. And not only will it do it for the rest of your life, but it will go on past your life when you die. That prayer is a memorial prayer. And it will live on and live on and live on. How, what do you mean, pastor? Do you remember when Jesus asked his disciples in Gethsemane, could you not pray with me one hour? Could you not? Somebody come to the piano, please. Somebody, the organ, the piano, please. Could you not pray with me one hour? Somebody say 60 minutes. 60 minutes. Say 60 minutes. 60 minutes. Say 60 minutes. 60 minutes. Could you not pray with me just 60 minutes? Everybody shout 60 minutes. 60 minutes. The disciples said, we're tired. And Jesus said, could you just pray with me? And they slept. They had no idea what was going to do. Jesus was in captivity much like um, what we read today in the book of Jeremiah. Why was he in captivity? He was in captivity because he didn't really want to die. He, in fact, the Bible teaches us that he wanted to change his mind on his father. He said to his father, I, I can't do this. I, you need to let this cup pass from me. I can't let them beat my back. I can't let them pull my beard off my face. I can't let them spit in my face. Because the Bible says he knew everything that was going to happen to him because it had been previously prophesied even in the Old Testament. He tried real hard. Peter, could you pray with me? James, could you pray with me? Johnny, could you pray with me? I'm too tired. Can't pray with you. The Bible says his disciples fell asleep. What they didn't know is that the greatest moment in history was about to take place. And he knew, Jesus knew. He said, if you could just pray with me 60 minutes... Just 60 minutes. Let me tell you, when you get thousands of people together and you get China, I don't know of any church, and I, I don't want to overemphasize this because I don't want us to feel like that we are greater than anybody else, and we are not, because we have to have humility. But in the morning, everyone, 
as best as I know, in this central time zone. In, in this central time zone. And, and, oh, I forgot to tell you this. Pastor John, where are you, Pastor John? I, I'm sorry, Pastor John, we should have put that on the... I forgot that 2,000 churches in the Amazon under Pastor John's son-in-law and daughter are joining us, but they're in the same time zone in South America. I don't know why I forgot that, Pastor John. And you, Pastor John is going to pray in, on behalf of them. So they got 2,100 churches in their organization, and they're going to pray with us. I forgot. Oh, please forgive me. Man, I forgot. Well, I should be jumping. Up. What's the matter with me? South America, Africa. Who would have ever dreamed that India, 55,000, are praying at the same time, 6 to 7 Central Standard Time, which could be the largest prayer meeting in 60 minutes on planet Earth. Could be. Somebody help me clap. I mean, I mean, I mean you may not be there. You, you've decided not to be there, but I'm going to tell you the majority of the church is going to be there. The 8.30 congregation, the 12.30 congregation, all of those online are coming. And I know it's Labor Day weekend and, it, and it's always a low a weekend of, uh, of, uh, uh, of attendance. But let me tell you, something's going to happen here. And I would love to tell you, and, 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 and I'm going to say this, this is, this is really hard for me. You think it might be easy. You may say, oh, pastor, you're just pushing and you're promoting. You're going to get everybody there. This is, this is really hard for me. Ask any pastor. Go to any pastor and say, is it hard to gather people to pray? You can get tons of people when you give out trick-or-treat candy. You tell them you're going to have a fireworks display and thousands will show up. Everybody will, everybody will go bowling if it's free. And everybody will eat pizza when it's free. But a prayer meeting? And I'm happy to announce unashamedly that the majority of Family Christian Center rises up in the morning. And they come from Illinois and they come from Indiana and they come from Wisconsin and they come from Michigan. And we're going to change the world in the next 60 minutes in the morning. I don't know what God's going to do, but he's got some big plans. And he does it only through prayer. Jesus said, I, I don't want to die. You're going to have to get a better idea, God, Daddy. You're going to have to get a better idea. I don't know how people are going to be saved. We just keep slaughtering sheep and bullocks. I can't do this. I can't get nobody to pray with me. I can't do it. You read in the garden. Think about the fact, in fact, Jesus was so, under so much pressure, the Bible said blood started coming through his sweat glands. The Bible said he, he sweat great drops of blood. He was under so much pressure. And he's actually, he's actually talking to his father and he's saying, I'm not doing this. I, I can't do it. But he's praying. You may feel like, I can't pray, but just pray. Because when about the time you feel like you have no words to say, an angel will show up right, right behind you. And the Bible said an angel was praying while he was praying in the 60 minutes, an angel came. And the Bible said an angel strengthened him. And the Bible says that the angel gave him joy. And all of a sudden, at the end of the 60 minutes before Judas Iscariot kisses him and before they arrest him and before they slug him with their fist and pull the, you know, his beard off his face and they put a crown of thorns and they beat his back and they take him to Calvary and they kill him. The Bible says in Hebrews that the Bible says he set joy before him to endure the cross. In other words, in that 60-minute prayer, God gave him joy. God sent an angel. I want to tell somebody, every person in this room needs Psalms 91. You need angels charged over you, where you live, where you work, and where you go. And I will tell you in the morning, there will be millions of angels that will hover over this place. God will dispatch maybe a dozen in your life, or maybe a hundred. I don't know how many you need. You will feel the strength. 
And the Bible said joy was set before him to endure the cross. And that 60 minutes of prayer is still affected everybody in this room. That prayer is still living 2,000 years later. When I tell you that in the morning your prayer will live until eternity. It will live on and on and on and on. And not only will it live on, but it will be so powerful in which it's going to change and God's going to give some great things that are going to happen in your life. The power of God will be here. This is not my idea. When the Lord appeared to me, when the angel of the Lord and that being appeared to me 38 years ago, this was not my idea. And if you'd have told me, hey, 39 years from now, there will be thousands of people and then there would be India and then there would be China and then there would be Africa and then there would be the Amazon with 2,100 churches praying with us, I would say it'll never happen. But something is happening at the place where the name of the Lord is. And God is about to do something. And I beg you, I beg every person, I'm going to pray against that nuclear plant that's in Ukraine, that Russia is surrounded and they feel like that any moment that thing could go off and I don't know where it's headed. I don't know if, it, if a rocket is headed for south for Israel or headed for America or headed for Europe. But I'm going to believe that angels are going to disarm that in the morning. Can I get anybody? That it will not touch New York because this is the month of Rosh Hashanah. In just a few weeks and everything's going to break loose. You better listen to me. Hurricanes are already gathering in the Atlantic. There'll be earthquakes in the next few weeks. We had 9-11 before atonement. All kinds of things will rock and roll because Satan is afraid of atonement and thinks that the Lord will come back. This will be the season if the Lord comes back after we repent for 10 days. And in the morning when we come and pray, I believe God has got an agenda for the United States of America. And I want to let the devil know we are going to run murder out of Chicago. We're going to run suicide out of our schools. We're going to pray for our children. Our children will go to the gym. They'll have orange juice. You bring them, just drop them off in the gym. They'll be well taken care of. Then they'll come out. Every one of your cars are going to be anointed. I'm sending the elders to touch the tires with oil. People may laugh about that. Go on and laugh. While your car is wrecked and damaged, our cars are going to be protected by angels. Everybody stand in this building. Everybody stand in this building and say, oh God. Say, oh God. I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray. In the name of Jesus, I'm going to pray. Take your communion cup. First Sunday of the month, we always take Holy Communion. And so today, as you take the cup, and if you do not have this cup, please, please raise your hand. Ushers, would you look for the hands that are lifted? They need a cup of communion. Today I go to the cross. Today I go to the cross. And today, today we make strong commitments. And in 2023, God has raised all of you up. I, I, I've not come to Family Christian very long. God knew you would be a part of us. You're to come at six o'clock in the morning. You're to come, you'll see something you've never seen before. Some of you will see masses of people which you never get to see because we have so many multiple services, Wednesday through Sunday. And in the morning for 60 minutes, for some of you, it may be difficult to get in the parking lot. Don't be, don't be impatient. The fact is, is that if you get in here the last 30 minutes, the last 20 minutes, the power of God is it will come, 60 minutes, and as I will lead you in prayer. If you have your communion cup, look at the cross, please. Say these words, Lord Jesus, forgive me. If there is anything in my heart, if there is anything in my heart before I take Holy Communion, before I take Holy Communion, forgive me. Forgive me. Give me a clean heart. Now lift the cup up. I'm going to bless it. In this cup that you hold is life. This cup that you hold is healing. This cup 
you hold is strength. And joy is in this cup. Healing is in this cup. Last week I told you about a family in our church. Bullets went through that house, but it missed their children and missed them. That's because they take communion. Holy communion says, and Paul says, you can't die before your time. You will die, but you cannot die before your time. Holy communion is that powerful. It'll give you strength. It'll heal your body. And in the name of Jesus, everyone on this first Sunday, the Sunday in which at the end of this month begins a new season and a new year with God and you on Rosh Hashanah, I command the blessings of the cup. And for you that are watching and you're taking communion with us, let us now take, in Jesus' name, sing, singers. every one of you and everybody's gonna join in the massive prayer shout a great big amen amen and in the morning for one hour I promise you God's gonna do great things in your life I, I'm gonna tell you some things that are gonna blow your mind that God's gonna do and God is so happy and God is so excited so today when you walk out of here you need to tell people hey good things are going to happen to you and everybody say in Jesus name in Jesus name I leave I leave with plans with plans for my future for my future from God, God. turn around shake somebody's hand say see you in the morning God bless you I'll see you in the morning this communion that we did today is very special. The next communion on the very first Sunday will actually be in the week of Rosh Hashanah. And the next time we do communion on first Sunday will be right in the midst of the 10 days of repentance. And then on that Wednesday night will be the Day of Atonement. October 5th is the Day of Atonement. So the next time we do communion is gonna be right during the 10 days of repentance, the days of all, the days in which God said, prepare yourself. And, and I just wanna to say to everybody, get here, travel here, make plans to come October 5th on Wednesday night. We'll all be dressed in white. You can wear something white. If you don't have anything white, come anyway. But because the high priest went into the holies of holies on the day of atonement with white linen. So we are gonna come prepared uh, and we're gonna look like the Bride of Christ as the whole church. We did this the first time last year and it was powerful. The Day of Atonement is on Wednesday. So I wanna encourage you today that I'm so excited that you listened. In the morning, join, join us in prayer. I've said this before, but the Lord really, really did speak this. And there are times in which I say, should I continue the prayer? And it's that urging of the Holy Spirit saying, I told you to do it, don't stop it. When I die or when I pass off the scene, it may not continue, I don't know. But in this stage, under this anointing, under this leadership, 
I'm going to obey God about Labor Day prayer. If you're in driving distance, bring friends. They can be members of other church. Bring Christians. We will be praying with China, as you heard today, and we will be praying with India. I excite you and believe that your miracle is going to happen. This is probably one of the most incredible historic moments as you heard today. Let God be God. Get ready for transfer. Get ready for God.